Ani, Ojo, Lenore, Indigenicas, Maingan, Indodam, Niashinkaming, Indonjaba. I have just introduced myself to you in my language, Anishinaabe Moin. I've told you my name. My name is Lenore. I've told you my clan. Maingan, Indodam is my clan. The wolf is my clan. I told you where I come from, Niashingaming Indonjaba. And in doing so, by telling you where I come from, I have also told you where my sound comes from. Where my sound comes from. My sound, my voice, my breath, whatever it is that informs me about this land comes from this place. My name is Naukwe Gijigokwe, Nidijnakaz, Wabijeshi Nindodem, Neashingnaming Donjuba. So my Ojibwe name is Noonday Woman, Naukwe Gijigokwe, and I belong to the Martin clan, and I come from Neashingnaming. Ani, bonjour, Ritarut Nidijnakaz, Saging Donjuba. Anishinaabe mwen gani bemweton inzakton ni gani yawa Anishinaabe. San stands for the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And um, before uh, our dealings with the British, our people were known as the Saugeens. And our first treaty with the British Crown was in 1836, and that's how we were referred to as the Saugeens. And, um, but we had two uh, village sites, one at the mouth of the Saugeen River and one uh, near present-day Owen Sound, known as the Nawash Settlement. And those two um, communities um, developed to become known as the Saugeen First Nation and the Chippewas of Nawash Unceded First Nation. And it's those two communities, our two communities, that together form the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Sun territory, um, before any of our treaties were signed, was a very large territory of over 2 million acres in extent. And it started uh, down around uh, Goderich on Lake Huron and up around the peninsula and over as far east on Georgian Bay to about modern day Collingwood. Um. Who are Anishinaabek? My father translated the word Anishinaabe, Anishinaabek. My father had only a grade eight education, but he was a deep, deep thinker. And when he set about to translate the word Anishinaabek, it took him about two weeks. He broke the word down into its the smaller parts and he thought very carefully about these parts. And this is his translation, good of the earth. And the first time I heard that, I was just elated. I mean, I was so happy. And I think you'd be happy too, if you knew that your name was good of the earth, or where you came from was good of the earth. Anishinaabe means one person. Anishinaabe means two or more people. The Anishinaabe have been in the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation territory since time immemorial. Some of the stories from this area harken back 
uh, a very long time, back to when the water level in the Great Lakes was really low. And there was a land bridge between the peninsula and Manitoulin Island. And uh, a land bridge between uh, what is now Amberley, Ontario, to Alpena in Michigan. So I guess we could say that Anishinaabe has been in the area since the Ice Age. But if we look back at some of the stories our people have, we could probably say that Anishinaabe have been here, as I said, since time immemorial. And that could mean uh, before, before the Ice Age. Our people have stories about uh, ice or, or the winter, old man winter, coming down from the north. And it, it, to me, that just isn't, that isn't just a seasonal story, as in uh, the way we experience seasons uh, this year. But it also harkens back to a time when uh, there was a prolonged, uh, a pro prolonged winter. We have a responsibility to steward the land and the water. There is the connotation of responsibility. Responsibility to uh, steward the land, but a responsibility to learn and uh, make a living from the land. And if we go back to my father's translation of Anishinaabek as good of the earth, it, then it becomes our responsibility to take care of us because, I mean, we are the land. The land is us. We are who we eat. And we eat from the land. Uh, things that are harvested in the forest or the fields, uh, things that are harvested from, from the waters. We are those things, and they, they are part of us. And so we, I guess we speak for the land. So we, we steward the land. We take care of the land. We are the land. Water for Anishinaabe is really important. Uh, water is a source of life. Um, in another perspective, uh, water is the blood of Mother Earth. Water cleanses us. Water soothes our fevered brow. Uh, water quenches our thirst. Water sustains us. And uh, so it is Anishinaabe responsibility, particularly for the women, to take care of the water, to ensure that the water is clean, that the water is safe, that uh, people have water to drink. The land is referred to as Mother Earth. And um, as a mother, she, uh, she takes care of us. She feeds us. She, when we're, out, when we're out walking on the trails or maybe along the shore, I mean, she calms, calms us down, kind of takes away our stress, sings those uh, lullabies or uh, songs to us. So the earth takes care of us, and this is why we need to respect and take care of the earth. Animals are seen as brothers and sisters, sometimes they're uncles, sometimes they're grandfathers. Animals are animal people. And um, I don't know how many of us refer to animals as, as people. I, I try to do it. I try to use the uh, second person pronoun to say who is there rather than what is there. Who do you see coming? Who is making that sound? Whose footprints are those? So animal are, animals are people. 
um, in one of our stories, animals were the, uh, were the ones who took care of the first Anishinaabek. Mein Gun, the bear, made sure that uh, the Anishinaabek children had food to eat and a nice warm place to sleep. And Mein Gun, the wolf, was a protector of the, of the children kept them safe from harm. And the smaller animals, like uh, Gong says, the, the um, chipmunk, jitimo, red squirrel, uh, wabuzo, rabbit, all these smaller animals were then playmates for the children. And the children imitated, imitated their playmates. Our ancestors have uh, said for generations that the crown broke its promise uh, to us uh, to protect our territory. That promise was made in 1836, the Treaty of 1836, and it, uh, our ancestors paid for it by giving up a million and a half acres of the richest farmland in what would become the province of Ontario. And so with that promise made, the leaders were very uh, dismayed when the British Crown representatives came back in the 1850s and started pressuring for more land. And the leaders uh, said they wanted to keep the land for their children. There's always been a sense that the land is important in order to keep the people together as a people. And the British just continued, the British Crown's representatives uh, continued to pressure the leadership for a surrender. And our, um, because of the promise that was made in 1836, our people have always felt that the treaty in 1854 should never have happened. We, uh, our leaders shouldn't have been forced to surrender the Saugeen Peninsula. And as I said, um, that's a, a half a million acres uh, that goes around uh, Lake Huron from the mouth of the Saugeen River over um, to Owen Sound on the Georgian Bay side. And those lands were eventually sold to settlers and um, proceeds for those sales went into trust accounts held for both um, First Nations. Uh, there's a lot of um, controversy over how those lands were managed and whether our people ever got the value for those lands that they should have. But the underlying uh, sentiment is that we never should have been forced to surrender the peninsula and so there have been efforts over the last uh, 30 years to try to recover some lands on the peninsula. Uh, there are a lot of crown lands. The crown still holds land on the peninsula, both the, in the form of the federal government and the provincial government. There's about 10% of the peninsula that's owned by Canada and Ontario about 50,000 acres. And because the Crown broke its promise by forcing the surrender in 1854, uh, the purpose of the land claim, which has been filed in court, is to get back any lands that the federal government and the provincial government currently hold on the peninsula to have those returned to the ownership of the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. And for the lands that were sold to settlers were uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation is not trying to get back any private lands, but we uh, are demanding that the uh, Crown, both Ontario and Canada, compensate us for those lands that have been uh, sold and are now privately owned on the peninsula. So we're trying to get back Crown lands and to get compensation for private lands to try to put us back in a situation as if we had never been forced to surrender the peninsula. And so the land claim that's currently before the courts, uh, 
its main focus is to try to undo, to the extent it's possible in law, to undo the harm that was done by forcing the surrender of the peninsula in 1854. So Anishinaabe history can be seen in two ways, one as oral, and one as kind of written documentation, okay? Um, I would say that unfortunately, a lot of people believe that stuff that is written is, tr is true, and stuff that is not written is fabricated. What one needs to understand is that I think still to the most part, our people are operating in oral tradition, not writing things down. And I think that's important to understand. Because in oral society, the spoken word is a matter of life or death. If someone gives you instructions on how to do something, or how to get from A to B, for example, and be safe. You need to listen. You need to listen. And they have the responsibility of being forthright and well-spoken when they, when they give you that information. I don't believe that the same thing is held for writing. I've used this example that uh, contracts are written um, in triplicate or quadruplicate, right? Um, some history is, uh, some things are documented uh, with the written word and appear in books. And the thing is, when you when you take those books, you 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 know you go down, you take them down, uh, you look through them, you you read them, you underline, or maybe you make little notations in in the margins, uh, or you highlight, or maybe you fold the picture to the the corner down, or maybe you flip to the back and you're making notes, right? And then you take, or you put your bookmark in there, and you take that and you stick it up on the shelf so that you'll remember it for next time. But the only way you remember it is by going back and looking at your annotations and looking at the highlights and the underlined and the folded down pages. In oral tradition, you hold them in your heart and, and in your mind. That's how you remember. And it's important because then your life depends upon those memories. So it's not as if, you know, our, our, our stories and things were, were made up, you know, as some kind of a joke. They're not fiction. Um, I think for the longest time, our stories have been viewed that way. When I was a child in um, Indian Day School, we were told that we did not have a civilization, that we did not have a culture, that our people were primitive, and that our stories were figments of a primitive imagination. And that is something, that's something I refuse to believe. I'm a storyteller by choice. I chose to be a storyteller. <clears throat> okay. I fell in love with Anishinaabe stories. I did not want to believe that we were just primitive, simple-minded beings. And so I made it a point during my growing up years, and even now in my adult and senior years, 
to be respectful of Anishinaabe stories. And what I have learned over the years is that these stories aren't mere metaphor. If you listen to the stories carefully and you respect the stories, then you come to understand the information that they hold. For example, there, there's a story and I've told this a number of times about a giant beaver uh, creating a dam that blocked the water from flowing into the, into the Great Lakes, the lower Great Lakes. So uh, uh, Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, for example. And to understand that story, one had to, has to understand what the landscape looked like when that story came into being. Because if we take that story at, you know, and, and, and apply it to the landscape that we know now, it doesn't make sense. But if we look at the geologic history of the area, and the research that has been done, then we'll see, we see where those stories fit in. History is not always written down. History is documented for Anishinaabek in, in our stories. Um, people used to refer to Anishinaabek stories as myths and legends, you know, um, stories made up by a primitive mind. But our stories were how we communicated, how we remembered things, how we conveyed uh, feelings and information. So that's what these stories hold. They hold information for us. There was a time when it was believed that the Anishinaabek, or the Indian, would vanish from the race of, face of the earth. There was a time when uh, non-native people believed that the Indians would vanish. And uh, so in order to save some uh, relics of, this loss, of these lost people, uh, ethnographers went out. <laughs> all across the country and uh, documenting, writing, asking questions and, 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 and documenting uh, the answers. Um, and so some of our oral traditions, our oral stories are documented in that manner. They're, they have been written out. However, one has to be really careful about those documentations because those people who were, who were writing them out didn't always agree with what they were hearing, and therefore they edited them. Um, they, uh, in, for, for some of the stories, for example, they, uh, they sanitized them. Now, I need to explain this. In Anishinaabe stories, there's an element of scatology. So that is a reference to poop, pee, snot, and sex. And these elements are in these stories because if we did not function without, without those things, we would, we would die. And there was nothing dirty about talking about a, a fart or a bogut or a measy or even a... Or, or even sex. It's part of who we were. So these elements are in the story. So what I'm saying is that when the stories were sanitized, certain things were taken out and made kind of wholesome. And uh, as a result, when you read those stories, they, they don't make sense. I think it's important for newcomer communities to understand the history 
of colonization and how our communities have been really oppressed by the federal government and the Department of Indian Affairs. Uh, after the land was taken away, the, uh, our communities were isolated on very small reserves and our traditional uh, harvesting of the fisheries was very uh, restrained and our ability uh, to harvest off outside of the boundaries of our reserves was also subject to surveillance and prosecution. And uh, the uh, department, uh, Indian department, refused uh, to recognize our hereditary chiefs. Our, our governance uh, historically or traditionally is based on the leaders of each clan being uh, heads of their families and these clan leaders coming together uh, to make uh, decisions for the benefit of the people. And under the Indian Act that came into effect in 1876, the government, the federal government, uh, refused to recognize our hereditary chiefs and imposed a municipal style uh, election system. And also under the Indian Act, they controlled, the federal government controlled the uh, chief and council in terms of what powers they had. They were recognized as having only very limited local uh, authority and they controlled our trust funds and they controlled our membership in terms of who could be registered uh, or recognized as belonging to our communities. And the other thing that they did which had a devastating impact on the communities was they uh, created Indian residential schools and sent our children uh, to those residential schools and uh, where they were uh, forced to uh, learn to speak English and to, and to um, they were uh, overworked and underfed and in many cases subject to physical and sexual abuse. And uh, I think that uh, it's important for newcomers to understand the harms that were done and uh, to, uh, especially with respect to residential schools, to become aware of that uh, history. And there was uh, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that operated for uh, six years uh, and reported in 2015. And those reports are available on the internet and if newcomers want to understand the current uh, hardships in our communities and trauma that does exist, uh, they need to really become aware of the history of Indian residential schools. And uh, also one of the uh, subjects that's finally coming to light, even though the um, survivors of the schools knew of this, was that many children died in those residential schools and were buried on the grounds of the residential schools. The children's bodies were not sent home to their uh, communities and these uh, their graves were often left unmarked. And so far it's been recorded over the past summer that there's more than 5,000 unmarked graves uh, surrounding residential schools across the country. And that has been uh, devastating uh, to uh, communities and where uh, communities are pressing for uh, those graves to be um, documented and for the children to be returned uh, to their uh, communities and this is one very sensitive topic that it is important for uh, newcomers uh, to understand and be respectful of. One P. Ebidagushna chik pemadsa chik otto kaming binjabajik. We can't want kina toshabeja woman. Kinaman Piggy begin the woman king. Nishagwe to Pepe Khan, 
ਕਤੋ ਇਨ ਤਨ ਚਪਾ ਮੈਂ ਕਾਮਿੰਗ ਆਨ ਇਨ ਚਪਾ ਮੈਨੂੰ ਅਦਸ ਨਵੀਂ ਤਪਾਸ਼ਤ ਮੰਨੋ ਨੀ ਵਿਨ ਨੀ ਨਕਿਆ ਇਨਾ ਸਿੰਗੋ ਨੋ ਦਿਨ ਮੀ ਕੋ ਕਿਨੇ ਸ਼ਬੇ ਸ਼ਕੋਇ ਵਾਬਨਾ ਸ਼ਾਉ ਨਾ ਇਹ ਤੇ ਕਿਸ਼ਮਕ ਕੀ ਵੇਤਨ kinna everybody or everyone da means lives here we are all one we are all connected as one i think that newcomers to canada need to know and understand the history of indigenous peoples that is the history of first nations people of inuit people and of meti i think in this area that uh newcomers to the traditional son territory need to know about us our history our culture they need to understand uh what sogin means for example like the sogin river um or the potawatomi they need to understand those um and they need to know what rights our people have within our traditional territories anishinaabe moen means the language it's our language because it includes anish nabe moen the n part is the language yeah. um how do you greet people in anish nabe moen ani <laughs> Um not much difference just that when you say bonjour it has more meaning to it it's like with a handshake How do you say I will see you again Pama pi menoa go up me <laughs> <laughs> 